Hey everybody, it's Derek Clamartin from CodeOpinion.com. A venture-driven architecture has a lot of benefits. Loose and temporal decoupling, scaling, resilience, and many more. But what does that really mean? What are some actual use cases? Well, I'm gonna describe four practical examples of using an event-driven architecture. I'd like to thank Solus for sponsoring this video. Solus provides a complete event streaming and management platform that makes it easier to design, deploy, and manage event-driven architecture across hybrid, multi-cloud, and IoT environments. For more on Solus, check out the link in the description. So the first practical example is third-party services, how you interact and deal with them. In most cases, when something happens within your system, an event, you need to then interact and call out to a third-party service. So this is where event-driven architecture can benefit. We have example here of a sales boundary that's gonna publish an event for say an order was placed. And I have different consumers that need to handle different integrations. For example, the first one is maybe a consumer that wants to handle and deal with the integration of sending out an email. And it's gonna to talk to say AWS SES. We have another consumer that needs to send out an SMS, a text message, and it's gonna be interacting with Twilio. And then we have a third one that's doing webhooks and just sending requests to other HTTP APIs. So to illustrate this, our sales publishes that event to the broker, it's the producer, and it's publishing that to a topic. And like I said, we have these three different consumers. Because they're all independent and they're all temporally decoupled, sales is done, it's left, it's doing its whatever else it needs to do is get more orders. But from there, we can have our different consumers independently pick up these messages from this topic. So they're consuming, they're subscribing to this topic. So our first consumer, that email, it can interact with AWS SES and send out the email that it needs to. At the exact same time, concurrently, either in a separate process, separate thread, again, this is about kind of logical decoupling. We have a separate consumer, this is maybe our webhooks, and it needs to interact and send out uh, our HTTP calls to other HTTP APIs that we want to integrate with. And again, this one may finish first. This is all can be done concurrently. We're finished here. Maybe we have our separate uh, SMS to Twilio and it is done completely separate. Maybe it takes a little bit longer because we have more SMS that we need to send out. Each one of these are independent. What this means is, is that if we decide that, you know what, email is no longer relevant, we don't want to support this anymore, we can just remove that consumer. All that code and all that logical uh, capabilities is defined within that consumer. Maybe we need to add a new consumer that's gonna be doing push notifications. Well, we can add that, it's just another consumer. It's con gonna be compartmentalized, it's its own independent thing, and it operates independently. So as I mentioned at the beginning, with the benefits of a venture of an architecture, how they play out and benefit from external services is because you don't own external services. You don't control their availability, how what their uptime is, and how you wanna handle when they're down. So each different consumer, because it handles a different integration and because it's independent, it can deal with however it needs to when your external service is potentially unavailable. So the second practical example in an adventure of an architecture is long running business processes and workflows. So to illustrate this, let's go back to my sales example, is that when an order is placed, there's multiple different services involved in completing the entire life cycle of an order from it being placed to build to shipped out. So what this means is when sales accepts the order, it publishes the event to a topic to our broker. Let's say that event is called order placed. From there, billing, because it's a part of this workflow, it is basically consuming and subscribing to that event so that once it receives it, it knows, okay, I need to invoice or charge the customer. Once it's done that, it places an order build event back to our topic, it publishes that. And then the same type of thing here is that at this point, Warehouse knows that it needs to pick up that event, do what it needs to do in terms of maybe creating a shipping label and allocating the products. And once it's done that, it creates a shipping label event that it publishes out. And our soul sales is picking that event up to maybe mark our order now as it's being ready to ship. Now, all of this is done through events and it's called event choreography, where you kind of have different boundaries, different services, consuming events and publishing events. They don't necessarily know that they're a part of the entire workflow, that they're just a piece of it and they're doing their part in completing the entire workflow. Event choreography is a way to execute a long running business process. It's kind of like a handoff where each service is kind of independent. They're just a piece of the puzzle where they consume an event and publish an event. 
So my third practical example is related to state transfer, but not necessarily in terms of propagating data across different services, but rather the shape and mutating the shape of it for different use cases. So for example, we have our producer, it publishes our event that potentially can, contains kind of the state change that happened, but we have different consumers. One of those consumers might be consuming it so that it can invalidate a cache or update a cache, but there might be other ones, for example, where it wants to change the state, the kind of the shape of that data for to put into a data warehouse for reporting purposes and BI. Maybe we have an entirely different consumer that we're really unsure of the analytics of that, but we're just dumping that data into a data lake and we're gonna be transforming it and doing some analytics on it later. But again here, when you think about kind of changing the shape, because not all data is represented the way that you necessarily want it to be in all use cases. So it's being able to kind of take the event that contains state and apply it to some type of read repository, whatever the case may be, that's in more of a shape related to the use case that you need. So what this allows you to do is be a little bit more real time, if you wanna be, related to how you deal with this data and these shapes of data in terms of reporting. Typically, when we're talking about data warehousing and these types of things, we're not real time. We're more doing things about batch jobs, daily, hour, however often you want to do these data transformations. But using an event-driven architecture and kind of passing this state around, it allows you to be a little bit more real time. So for my last example, what I wanna talk about is temporal coupling and internal integration between your services within your own system. So we're often used to doing request response, synchronous request response between different services. This could be making an HTTP call or gRPC. Regardless, it's all kind of the same, which is they're blocking calls and they're temporally coupled. So what I mean by that is when sales had that order that was placed, it needed to reach out to billing so that we could charge the customer, create the invoice, whatever it's doing. So if we make that call and that works, we then need to subsequently make the next call to the warehouse to tell it, okay, I build everything. Now I need you to create the shipping label and allocate the products, do whatever you do. The problem is what happens if this fails? Now we had to make all these calls sequentially. Having in code to manage this in terms of retries and compensating actions, now we have to go back to billing to try to cancel that invoice or refund that order because we can't fulfill it from the warehouse. All this was done because it's temporary coupled and we have to make one request after the other. There's no isolation. So to illustrate this, we've removed that temporal coupling because billing doesn't actually need to be available for us to actually accept that order. We've accepted the, the order. Our order was placed. We published that event to the topic. If billing isn't available and it can't consume that event, then yes, our workflow will stop, but that doesn't mean it can't continue once billing becomes available again. Once billing comes back online and consumes that order placed event, it does what it needs to do. The workflow just continues on because it will publish an event, the warehouse will pick it up, just like I mentioned in that workflow example. Because you remove the temporal coupling, you start treating your internal services just like you do external services. Meaning that before, when you're making synchronous request response, everything had to be available and online to complete any workflow. When you move to an event-driven architecture, because everything's independent, not everything has to be available at the same time. Hopefully this illustrated the different ways that you can leverage event-driven architecture. In terms of dealing with third-party integrations, how you wanna handle long-running business processes and workflows, changing the shape of data in more real time for analytics and reporting, as well as treating your own internal services more like external services and having them temporally decoupled. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.